Good morning. Good morning. And uh, um, blessings on your new spectacles. Oh, oh, these are reading glasses, actually. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I'm kind of in between right now. Uh, so uh, I can see it's very interesting. Uh, as you know, I had my cataract surgery in my right eye. And uh, next week, I have it in the left eye. So uh, testing this out, I can see a whole lot better with my right eye now. Just one second, just one second. You had surgery on your right eye? On the right one. And, and so what, day, what day of the week was that? Tuesday. And today is Monday. So a week ago and already your, your eyesight is... is uh, noticeably better in the right eye it's like uh, looking at uh, outside and seeing a bright sunny day but when i look in my left eye it's a cloudy day <laughs> wow so next next week a week from tomorrow actually i think yeah tuesday I have the other eye done you uh, can't so wait can you yeah, I'm, I'm happy for it. Uh, so these are reading glasses for up close. So you're a lot more handsome than I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I yeah. should have encouraged you to get I should have encouraged you to get that uh, that surgery years ago. I know. See, I'm looking. Yeah. So uh, close up. So I'm I'm. I keep I keep uh, reaching for my regular glasses, which I'm they're not there anymore. So I'm um, I'm kind of uh, getting used to the transition of the up close reading glasses. So uh, I have the, these. Up, up, the up close uh, until now, until you had the surgery to read up close. You use your other glasses, or you use no glasses? What do my regular glasses? They were for had one lens for long looking and the other one for short looking. See, I have so, I have glasses. I have glasses, but these glasses are just for distance, for like driving. And so right. when I sit and uh, I, I can barely use them, I, it's very difficult to read with them. And it, it bothers me a little bit when I'm not, you know, like this far from the like a foot or two away from the computer. And I so and this, I prefer to I prefer to uh, take pictures without my glasses. So, <laughs> well, Peggy had had this back in uh, November, December, and she didn't need glasses at all. That's so amazing. So they, she had uh, contact lens uh -huh. that she wore. So basically, the idea is they took the the contacts lens and they made them permanent implants in her eyes. So well, that, that's that's not cataract surgery, or is that cataract surgery? Yes. So they removed the cataracts, and they put uh, her contact the, the equivalent of her contact lens, but permanent lens in her eyes. It's amazing technology. I was just thinking about that. Such amazing technology. When they invent all this stuff, unbelievable. I'm glad I wasn't the one they practiced on. <laughs> <laughs> So, anyway, uh, so <clears throat> have you recovered from your trip to Dubai? Um, I recovered from it. I, I wish I was still uh, still feeling it more. Are I had still... a friend of mine, a few friends of mine said, oh, tell me about it. So I told, I think, one friend or two. But one other guy said, let's talk about it. And I kept on missing him. And now he's in Dubai without even uh, me getting a chance to tell him what he should do there. So he's he's going to have his own experience. Yes. Did I did I share with you some of my favorite parts of Dubai? Well, you did, but uh, the parts that I remember is meeting the people, of course. Man, eh, that's all that counts. That's all that counts. Meeting the people, and and as a matter of fact. Today we had a, uh, a long discussion on our Among Friends WhatsApp group. I don't know if I've ever told you about that group. You're, you're, you're familiar with WhatsApp, yes? You heard of WhatsApp? 
I've I've heard of it, and I think Peggy used it one time when we were in Israel, but I, I don't know how to use it or anything yeah. about it really. So WhatsApp is uh, is a little bit like a blood infusion for Israelis or 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 uh, oxygen. Without WhatsApp, then you then you can't uh, manage it all. It's like it's oh well, that's what that's what Israeli is nowadays. Anyway, so we have about a dozen I don't know a dozen two dozen friends, half of whom are. Jewish and half of whom are Christian. And we just try to be friends with each other, like you and me. But imagine a group of about two dozen of us, Christians and Jews, a, sh a shared community, and uh, spending most of our time talking about what we have in common. And the longer we are friendly, the more we feel comfortable pushing the envelope, pu pushing the edges a little bit, and, and uh, maybe dealing with topics that we wouldn't have dared deal with uh, otherwise. I understand. So today we, uh, I don't remember what we talked about exactly, but we did, um, we did move forward a little bit. You, that, you remind uh, me of, you remind me of the, uh, of the, of the uh, Christian having his uh, church service and he doesn't remember the sermon by the time he gets to the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> is that the, is that the uh, person in the audience or the person who gave it? No, the person in the audience, the, the person listening to the sermon. Uh, sometimes it, it, uh, it doesn't take root in their heart. So by the time they get to the parking lot, they don't remember what the sermon was about. <laughs> you're, you're too nice to say that it sometimes doesn't stay. I would say that very infrequently does it stay, does it say stay? Depends on the individual, I guess. Anyway, you're you're just you're just hoping that uh, when you teach, then uh, your your students will remember a little bit longer than that. <laughs> it, it's about 10%. It's been my observations. About 10%, eight to ten percent of a bigger population actually uh, internalize what you teach them, and it becomes part of their life. Eight to 10% of any given classroom? Uh, well, beyond that, of any, of, any, of any general population group of anything, uh, I, would, I, would, I would be generous and say a tithe, 10% of, the, of, any, of any mass of people respond in a lifestyle change to what you're explaining to them. Ah, wait a second. Responding in a lifestyle change, that, that's very a uh, high level. That's like, that's like my wife. You know, like she says, oh, I learned something here? Quickly, let me change my life about it. Like every single time. Whoa, <laughs> that's a little bit uh, too, uh, too wild for me. I say, listen, hmm, that's an interesting idea. And if I can remember it and even tell it over, very good. But it, I don't, I don't, I per, I'm talking about myself now. I don't know that uh, every um, message, every lesson, as important as it is, it, it, it's expectable that I will turn around to 180 every time I hear something new. No, no that's very true. That's very true. I'm talking about the core, core life issues, you know, of how of how you treat people and how you get along with people and how do you relate to people and being a servant-minded person rather than being other-centered rather than self-centered, a change of your, your life. Okay, but if you see, you're saying that's a change to that. So somebody who was self-centered, all of a sudden... For the first time in his life, you heard Dr. Booker giving a sermon, and boom, 180. But other people are nice. I mean, I am assuming that most of you return students, they're nice people to begin with. Right? So what can you I can't, I can't answer that question. <laughs> oh, come on. I'm sure you can. I know, I know many of your students, well, or at least some of them. Being nice. So I, can, I can vouch for them. <laughs> well, that's a good report. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> so, so it really, what uh, it, you might remember actually, we we uh, reviewed 
the letter of Nachmanides to, yes. his, to his children and to his students. And one of the things that he wrote there is that whenever you learn something, review it and see if there's anything that you can apply immediately. That's very true. It's very good. So I, I remember that. I, I learned the, as I probably told you, I learned the, uh, the letter of Nachmanides many times. When I, I probably said that when I was in the army, during my second stint in the military, it was six month stint that I said, after my first nine month stint, I believe it was, I said, oh, the army, there's a lot of downtime. So I'd better prepare to fill up my time with, with learning Torah, with learning the Bible and learning important uh, things. So I said, every morning after morning prayer, I would read a chapter of the ethics of the fathers. There are six chapters and there are six days of the week, except for Shabbat. And after that, I would read the entire um, a letter of Nachmanides. And, uh, for, you know, and that means every single day I would read it for six months. That's about 180 days, more or less. So I probably learned it by heart. And the very, at the very least, I could probably can, uh, finish up certain sentence, sentences in it. But that was a long time ago. My gosh, let's see. I was uh, 19, let's say, 20, and now I'm 58. About 40, no, about 38 years ago. I think I should start re reviewing it again. Probably but uh, that's, that's, where, that's where I learned about this idea. That you should really try to incorporate things that you've learned into your life. And I, I, that's where I learned that concept. But the idea of actually doing it, I find that I do it all the time. In other words, the, the Torah that I learned, whether it be verses from the Bible or passages in the Talmud or passage, a passage, a famous passage in Rashi. You know, Rashi, he's Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, one of the, the greatest uh, commentary, commentator, commenter on the, on the Bible, the Jewish Bible, the Jewish commentary. Com I, have, I have his commentary here. Of course, of course. So, you know, there are certain uh, passages in those, in those uh, texts that if you start saying the first word or two, I'll be able to finish it off because it's very important. And I, I both believe in it and, and, and it, it's part of my life, I think. I really think so. I very really good. Think. And, and that's what people should strive to do both in learning God's word and any other positive uh, uh, teaching that they hear. You know, people who uh, like uh, poor Richard's almanac from Benjamin Franklin, you heard of that, right? He's got some wisdom over there. Early to bed, early to, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Okay. Well, I don't know if that's the reason why I like going to bed early and I like waking up early. It might just because I'm getting on in years. <laughs> uh, I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> I see that you're wise. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, yeah the 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 ethics of the fathers, the book that you just referred to, uh, says the same thing that Yeshua said is to make disciples. First thing they said was to make disciples. Amiru uh, tamidi Make many disciples. But that many. was the first thing they said. Um, right. eh, eh, it was the second thing that they said. They, they said three things. When you sit in judgment, don't rush. Think uh, slowly and surely. And stand up, establish for yourself many students. Vasus yagla Torah. And make a offense around the Torah. Those are the three things that they said in the first Mishnah, the first passage in the, that book, The Ethics for the, of the Fathers. So if you, if you make many disciples, uh, their life is going to change as they live out the teachings that they learn from you. And so... You know what you mean? 
when you look at that situation, if you have a uh, hundred people in your class, mm -hmm. only 10 are going to be following in the dust of your sandals. The, uh, a, a, a teaching that I don't like so much. Now, of course you have to understand that there are many contradictory teachings um, in, the, uh, in the Talmud because it was, it was human beings trying to make, you know, make a, a place for themselves. But I think, I think that we have to also understand that not everything is right for everybody. Some people prefer it like this. Some people prefer it like that. Some people, this teaches, speaks to them more. This people, that speaks to them more. So one of the, one of the, one of the uh, um, passages from the Talmud that I remember is a thousand will go in to the hall of study and only one will come out and be a worthy student. You That's said 10 out of 100. I'll take 10 out of 100. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's been my observation for almost 50 years of teaching the Bible and ministering to people that about 10% is the, I think God, God gets a tithe of the humans. <laughs> Okay, so a person has to a person has to think, what am I doing in this world? Am I here just to be one of the 90%? Or am I here to try to figure out what the point of the world is and try to make sure that I'm that I'm part of that rationality? I, I have to admit, I haven't I haven't given that enough thought. I I probably have given it a lot more thought than 90% of the, of uh, human of uh, humanity. But I probably could give it a lot more thought. But uh, even still, I think that I am pursuing a life that is worthwhile. I remember when I was, I was uh, working as a technical writer in IT. And I said, okay, it's, uh, it's fun. Like there's a certain amount of fun in it. It's sort of like a, a game, you know, like, like to play a crossword puzzle to see if you can complete the puzzle. So to create a technical document, it's, there's a certain amount of, uh, of pu puzzlement going on over there. But I said, okay, am I going to spend the rest of my life, the rest of my career, um, documenting how component A interacts with component B? That's going to be my, my um, donation, my contribution to the world. And I said, forget this. And so I decided that I would um, focus more on uh, nonprofit organizations and uh, important um, important organizations, primarily that deal with education and and uh, social and social interaction. Very good. What about you, sir? I was just going along doing my own thing. <laughs> But the same thing, God put it into your heart. I had, I had my encounter with God in 1974 that changed everything, yes. But uh, I had a background similar to yours. I, I was a, what might call, be called a technical writer because mm -hmm. I worked in education uh, and systems, systems and computing and we called it management information systems in those days. And my uh, gifting was well, like you said, to take technical things and uh, explain them either through orally or in writing in non-technical ways for non-technical people. Right. And uh, God had given me a natural gift to do that uh, little did I know that he would use that experience one day to take a book that most people think is technical, the Bible, and explain it in everyday language for everyday people. And uh, when, when, when I had my encounter with God and it became clear to Peggy and I that I was supposed to be writing Christian books. Mm. Uh, that took a little while to figure that out, you know. Uh, now, Christians say this, 
I know this, this say talk like this, and we've talked about this before. The Lord told me, you yes. know, it didn't mean that he came down from Sinai and spoke to me face to face, like with Moses and said audibly, but he, he gave me the, the understanding, so I'll put it that way, that when I was to write my books, I wasn't to write them like you're supposed to. There's a certain uh, Christian book publishing company, or any book publishing company, any book publishing company expects you to follow certain guidelines in writing in writing the books for for the for their way of doing it you know right and i came to understand i'll say it that way from the lord that i wasn't supposed to do that rather and so what i would say this way the lord impressed me or told me or i had the understanding how do you like to say that is that i was to write books like I was sitting down on the couch next to the person talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. Now that's not the way you're supposed to write books. So this is how I felt the Lord wanted me to do this. And of course, publishers, they, they don't understand that. They didn't want that. But over the years, I cannot tell you how many correspondents Peggy and I've had from people who said, you know, Dr. Booker or Brother Richard, whatever they called me, when I read your book, now listen to this word for word, get on. Yes. It was like you were sitting on the couch next to me, talking to me personally, one-on-one. -on -one. We, we would call that a confirmation. <laughs> confirmation, a bullseye. <laughs> So God, God, as uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, confirmed that I was doing it the way He wanted me to do it. Okay, and you kept on doing it that way. <clears throat> so uh, writing it for everyday people, just like you're having a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. <laughs> but you see, I, I think that that's the right thing to do nowadays. Because it really, when, when, did, when did all this happen? The world has changed. It was, it was around 2000, a mere 21 years ago, that uh, people started using the internet. Maybe five years more, something like that. I remember when I got my first job in high tech, then we, uh, we had an, an internet computer for the whole company. If you needed to go on the internet, you go to that computer. And so less than 20 years ago, we started doing all this internet stuff and we started having what's called a long tail, which means that I can produce um, materials, content. I can produce some sort of a, of a, of a, a product for a small audience. In other words, if Random House publishes a book, we're not going to publish a book unless a million people are going to buy it. So you only had people buying books if, if they could fit into the, into the square box of the same million people. If you didn't like those books, then you're out of luck because you don't, there's only 100 publishers and they all publish the same one. But then little by little, the internet said, you know what? I can publish a blog by myself. I'm only publishing it for myself. You want to read it? Go right ahead. So I publish it for myself. And then one person sends me an email. I really like your blog. Oh, so I'm, I'm publishing it for two people. And then I might publish it for 100 people. But that's okay. They really like it. So people can get what they want. It's, it's so much better that way. And so when you're saying you wrote a book as if somebody's sitting next to you, even if you Im, Im, impact 1,000 people, 10,000 people, 100,000 people with all of your books, that's not enough for Random House. They wouldn't have wanted it. They would have, they would have rejected it. But you're helping even one person. That's already your, your, you are blessed in the eyes of God. There, there, there are many stories, you probably read some of them, of authors who became world famous and their books sold millions and millions of copies. But when they tried to get their first one published, the publishers wouldn't have anything to do with them. You know, right. so uh, you don't ever give up. Never give up. If you have something, if you have a burning bush in your heart, 
<laughs> you don't you don't ever let the system put put out the fire. You keep going with it. <laughs> well, if if it's the right kind of burning bush, then it ain't gonna go out. That's that's true. that that bush is not consumed. That's very true. So, Peggy and I, uh, I was just uh, a person that had been touched by the great spirit, you might say. Yes. And uh, I've worked in the business world. Yep. And so you come out of that and you have no credentials. You have no theology education. You have no, you don't have a big congregation of a thousand people. That would be right. a little, that would be a small group in Texas. You know? Right, right, right. <laughs> and you don't have, you don't have any TV program. Just like you said, you don't have uh, uh, 500,000 people who are going to buy your book. Right. Publishers aren't interested in you, even if you were the Messiah himself. They're not going to take your book. You know, they, they're, they're not going to do it. They, 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 they need to make money on, on it. That's the way it is. That's all it counts. And so uh, when we started out trying to get my first manuscript published, we got many rejection letters. And it went from bad to worse. <laughs> it went from rejection letters that some assistant publishing person actually typed a letter Aye. to pre-printed pre postcards. <laughs> pre-printed rejection postcards. And Peggy oh my and gosh. I said, Big and I said we could wallpaper our house with the pre-printed <laughs> rejection postcards from the publishers. But uh, as we just said, if you have a fire of God burning inside your being, you, 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 this is not something you want to do or need to do. It's something you have to do. And if you don't do it, you'll die trying. So we're still here almost 50 years later and 50 books later or whatever it is. So uh, <clears throat> we have been really blessed that God has let us live long enough to see the fruit from what he called us to do. Yes. Many, pe many people don't have that blessing. They, they die in the struggle. And, Most people uh, don't struggle because they're too busy trying, you know, just trying and wondering what's on the TV tonight. That's very true. The people so, who are struggling that they have a goal and they spend years and years and decades in their whole life and they, they don't reach that goal. That, that is uh, a little bit tragic, a, a little bit lot tragic. But I think that, there, that, there's, that there's value in the journey and a value in the, in the effort. Listen, I'm thinking of of two people who uh, really tried but but died before they reached what they were what they were uh, hoping to uh, achieve. Well, there's one guy called Moses. He never got in. <laughs> exactly. You read my mind. And 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 did Jesus achieve what he was hoping to achieve in his lifetime? Yes. He did. Yes. It's, so then, look, he said, don't worry, this is all, this is the way it's supposed to be. But he only had 11, 11 uh, uh, apostles, is that right? 11 followers? 12. 12, okay. One of, but one of them was a betrayer. A betrayer, all right. So I was right anyway. And uh, and one of them was betraying you know, on, you know, he, he got to choose 12. I don't know if he chose them or they chose him, but... It, I, I would, I would, it would seem to me that his uh, um, goal in life was to bring the entire flock of Israel. He, he writes that somewhere. What, what's the, I am here to bring the whole, what's, what's the verse over there? The lost sheep. To, the uh, lost sheep. So how many lost sheep did he find? He, I don't he, know. <clears throat> Well, we need to we need to talk about that for a minute. <clears throat> he found the ones that before he well to answer one of your 
questions, he chose them. So it says in the in the Bible that before he chose the 12, that he yes. spent all night praying about who he should choose. And any leader understands that. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you have to have some kind of discernment of who you're going to invest your life in. So um, if you look, if you look at it historically, uh, he he only he he had twelve he, that he chose. One betrayed him, which was written in the in the in the Bible that this would happen. It was a prophecy mm -hmm. fulfilled, of course. But um, because they were empowered by the Holy Spirit, they changed the world. So uh, billions of people claim to be followers of this man from Nazareth, a Jewish man. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So, but that's but that's yeah. after after his first time around uh, death. Again, if you're saying if you're saying no, 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 he, he wasn't a normal human, and then he went up and he went down again and he went back up again and and and, and all sorts of stuff like that. Okay, but if if you look at the human perspective, uh, the human side of Jesus, then uh, I, I uh, pardon me for uh, for being uh, sacrilegious, perhaps. I think that, I, and I think it's not bad. I think it's okay if we say that he didn't, he he didn't achieve what he would have liked to achieve in his lifetime. He's only thirty or something like that when he died, wasn't he? Moses was one hundred and twenty, and he didn't even make it. So, uh, you know, well, from, again, from, from from what I understand, again, I'm not, I'm far from a a, 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 a a very knowledgeable. He decided that he was laying down his life. He says, "This is the time. Tomorrow, three days, whatever." But uh, from a from a from a uh, more human perspective, and I guess then you're going to say, "Well, there you go. Don't try to look at it from a human perspective." Well, from the human uh, well, perspective, that's, that's, well, that's okay to do that, but if, as long as you have a bigger, the bigger picture of redemption perspective. But in the in the first century, Yeshua Jesus had tens of thousands of Jewish followers. Yeah, but that was still nothing compared to the the larger sects. Within. Well, he had a, he had a whole lot more followers than the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes and all the others. <laughs> yeah, a whole That's lot. Who? More. I huh? don't know about. I listen. I read your book. I read one of your books, and I was very impressed by it. Okay. But I'm I'm uh, challenging what you just said. I don't think so. I think that there were millions of Jews, and I and I think that there were only thousands of Jesus followers. Well, the, he well he had more followers than the Pharisees had. I, think I don't know. Were, I don't know. Okay, I think there were maybe. I think I may not be remembering it right. Maybe six thousand Pharisees, something like that. And Jesus had tens of thousands of followers. But the but the point is, from a Christian perspective, he came to give his life for the sins of the world, and this is what he did. Uh, even so, though, but, even, okay, but that that of course is a is a uh, spiritual divine realm, right? Here, here on Earth, those sinning um, centurions or whatever they were, the Roman soldiers who were who were uh, cutting off his uh, his I don't know what they were doing over there. They were gambling with his clothing, or I don't know what they were doing over there. They were sinning. They didn't stop sinning all of a sudden once he died. That's true. And the Jews, for sure, kept on sinning until, again, I'm talking from a Jewish person, my understanding of that period, that historical period. Ultimately, the temple was destroyed and the Jews were, were uh, killed in, in their millions. And, uh, many, and the rest were, not the rest, but most of the rest were exiled to all throughout the world, to the Rome. The, the, right. the, the temple was destroyed. And, and our, our tradition says that, that the temple was destroyed and the Jewish people were exiled because of our sins. So what you said before about him, again, I, I heard this and, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to repeat it. You'll tell me if I got it right. He died for our sins. 
right? That's our understanding. So, so what does that mean? What does that mean? He, he, he made a way for us to be forgiven and reconciled to God. In other words, if we would so choose that way. That's very true. And if very we don't true. choose that way, then, then we, he didn't do anything. It's like it's well, on the shelf. Your, you, have your, you, you have a free will. We have a free will. But uh, to. No, many of us don't even have that free will. In other words, all the people who've never heard of Jesus obviously don't have the freedom to choose. Well, that's another another discussion. But let me let me uh, point out something in in what we're talking about here. This has been two thousand years mm -hmm. since that happening, and I live. I'm a Gentile, and I live uh, in a foreign country on the other side of the ocean. Speak a different language with a whole different culture and yes. worldview and life. And I'm his pretty successful. <laughs> I, you, you, I'm sorry, I miss I missed the gate, the main uh, the punchline over there. What happened? So I'm just saying, two thousand years later, I as as a person who lives in a country on the other side of the ocean, <laughs> who has nothing to do with the first century. Yes, <laughs> of course and speak a different language and I have a different whole life and culture and nation, I'm his follower. So I would say that, that, that he did pretty good. <laughs> you bet. You better. And... So uh, in our view, he has two comings, you know. Right. For the first time as the Messiah been Joseph. Okay. Like Joseph suffering betrayed by his own, but uh, Joseph, of course, was exalted, and uh, everywhere he went, the Pharaoh sent him, all of the Egyptians bowed down and acknowledged him as the right-hand man to Pharaoh, and so uh, in our view, Messiah Yeshua Jesus will return then as the as the messiah ben david and the nations will honor him as they did joseph in egypt so this is our understanding and so again it says, it again, says that, that all that, israel will be saved <laughs> it says that in the old testament but again i'm 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 logically it sounds to me that if he's going to have a second coming that means that he's going to get all this stuff done in the second coming that he didn't get done in the first coming right uh, I guess you could put it that way. Otherwise, why bother with the second coming? If if uh, if we if we've, everything's happened in the first time, then it's then it's just that's, reruns. I've already seen this show. Very so if, if he if he didn't succeed in everything the first time around, then that's exactly no, no, what I was no, trying no, to no. say. No, Tom, he succeeded in his mission for his first coming mission. Okay, I'll give it to you. Okay. <laughs> So, all right. so well, so listen, we're we're uh, we're diving deep over here. The water's getting getting uh, deep. <laughs> uh, no, it's. I mean, we we go to different groups, and we have something we want to accomplish, but we know we can't do it all the first time. We have to keep going back. So, uh, in a similar way, he had uh, two purposes. One, his first coming was to, in our understanding, die for our sins so we can have forgiveness and reconciliation with God. But, uh, of course, uh, the world did not embrace him, although billions of people do today. But uh, the world never embraces righteousness. <laughs> it always hates righteousness. It always kills the prophets. It always kills righteous people. Right. But at but his second time appearing would yes. be to establish the fullest measure of righteousness among the nations, as the prophet says, the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So it would be like if you go to speak to a group again 
you have certain things you want to accomplish, but you can't do it your first time you go talk to them. You, you have to kind of see where they are so you can kind of uh, go go back a second time or third or fourth or how many times you have to go back to you accomplish your goals. So and you uh, and you hopefully will accomplish that goal before you uh, <laughs> while while in your lifetime. And so many times I've seen that the group is just not going to receive what the Lord gave me to give them. So okay. I don't keep going back. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you call it? You cover your losses. <laughs> Something like that. Yes. Yeah, so, so this is how we understand it. Uh, one Messiah, but two, two appearances. One as Messiah ben Joseph, who suffered un, the righteous for the unrighteous, right. betrayed by his own, but exalted and honored by the Pharaoh. And uh, when his brothers came to Egypt, they didn't recognize him, of course. The Hamloi Kiru, that's right. They didn't recognize him. And then he revealed himself to them, and they recognized him as, as their brother. Mm -hmm. And they, they expected bad things, probably, but uh, uh, he, he offered forgiveness and reconciliation to them. So we see that as a picture of the role Jesus. of Jesus sure. returning, not as a Gentile, <laughs> but as a Jewish line from the tribe of Judah. And that, uh, unfortunately, the Western world has made him into an Egyptian, if we might say, made him something that he not, he, he's not. So, Egyptian, Greek, Roman. Yeah, whatever. Say, take your choice. Right. So uh, they cult make they they uh, transform Jesus to be one of them in their their culture. So uh, when Peggy and I would travel some for fifteen years, uh, we would go different places, and you know, with the Christian world. And we would see uh, Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus in the manger, but he would be them. He would not be from Nazareth or Bethlehem. He would be from Oahu or wherever he's, you know, wherever you are. He would be them. So every time, every every community, every community, every society, making God in their image. That's it. That's it. Uh, Well-meaning. In many ways, of course, but uh, making him uh, uh, acceptable to their world and their culture, because right. uh, he's one of us. But over over centuries, the true identity of who he is is lost. Not to mention that he's one of us turns into he's not one of you. That's for sure. Yeah. That's very good. That's, wrong. Like That's very good. That's very good. Very good point. So what, what people like me have been, use the phrase, called by God to do in yes. the times that we're living yes. is to help Christians rediscover the Jesus of the Bible. And in doing that, they, they more clearly understand who he is and what he did. And a, a, the fruit of that, of course, is you and I are talking here today. Yes. And that if there is uh, anti-Semitism in the Christian's heart that they don't even know that's there, just because of the culture and world they're raised in, it may not be their fault at all. It's just there. When they discover the, the real Jesus, all of that goes out of them. And uh, all they want to do is, is love people, including showing the gratitude of debt to the Jewish people that we have for bringing us the word of God, bringing us the revelation of the one true God, bringing us to us the revelation of the Messiah, truth, scriptures, the prophets, <laughs> salvation, redemption, all the things that are really important come from the, the whole nine yards. Comes to us from the Jewish people 
So when you get that insight into your spirit being, how can you not want to go to Israel? <laughs> how can you not be a Zionist? How can you not want to love the Jewish people and things that are Jewish? You're, you're not trying to steal any sacred instrument. You're trying to show identification. And that's, and that's what I'm trying to do with Root Source, give people like that an opportunity to meet and engage with Jewish people, not the Jewish people, but Jewish people, a Jewish person. <laughs> Very good. Yes, when we, uh, when we had our first Crystal Knock Memorial in 1997, mm. it was very tense for everyone because we're meeting in a church sanctuary. Right. And, and Jews uh, were invited. I'm sorry. And Jews were invited to come. Of course, to we're trying to do just what you're doing. And so, of course, Jewish people have heard all kinds of things that happen in a Christian sanctuary. And none of those things that they were told were true, of course. Yes. But fear. So uh, encouraging any Jewish person to come into a church sanctuary was uh, not easy. Yes. Uh, but there's some brave souls who can think for themselves <laughs> and uh, realize that this is, this is a good thing we should be doing. You know, somebody says they love us. Well, let's see if they do. Why not give them a try, you know? Give them the benefit so of the doubt. That you had that side of it. And then the other side is, unless you work with a Jewish person at the office, most Christians don't know Jewish people. That's right. Which unfortunately separated. Some want it that way, of course. So uh, to come into a church sanctuary with Christians and Jews together there's certain spiritual forces that don't want that to happen. I'll put it that way. <laughs> because when Christians and Jews come together with unconditional love, it must be the days of the Messiah are at hand. Exactly. <laughs> you know? And there's, again, demonic forces that don't like that to happen. And so uh, it was, an, it was a, a tense moment for everyone because nobody knew how to what to do how to talk to each other what to say what to how to relate and right. so uh we had uh from the very beginning we had our candles set up there you know on the front where we had uh six candles for the six million jewish people who perished in the yes. holocaust then we had five candles for representing 5 million non-Jewish people perished in the Holocaust. And then we had the unity candle, of course. Mm -hmm, very nice. And so uh, we were blessed that God helped us. That I, got, I had uh, six leaders from the Jewish community who thought this was a nice thing to do, and they came. You know, like the president of the Jewish Federation, you know, people like this. Sure. Very important people uh, who came and like lit the candles for the Jewish people. And then we had Christian leaders. And then I usually, I always lit the unity candle with one, one of the Jewish people. Beautiful. But before... Uh, the meeting started, I had to get them there early. That was not easy in a place like Houston. <laughs> I had to get them all there early because uh, we wanted them to meet each other. Right. Who you're going to be lighting your candles with. Beautiful. And we also took photos of them together uh, before the meeting, and we sent the photos to all of them so they could have a photo of their candle lighting partner in their home or somewhere. Very nice. So, yes. So uh, an effort to get them to see, see, you know, relate to somebody that they never related to before. So when they, 
Yeah, when they lit the candles, nobody had ever seen anything like this ever happen. Pretty yes. emotional. I can hardly talk about it even now, all these years later, you know. So after they lit the candles, it was funny in a, in a human way. They just kind of turned back like they were going to go sit down. And I encouraged them to, to embrace one another. Wow. Wow, this was really pushing the envelope, get on. This was really pushing the envelope. But, well, when they did that, it was like breaking the ice. Wow. Everybody. Stood and applauded and started wow. hugging each other. And uh, I got a Bucharism out of all that way back then. Hugging is better than slugging. <laughs> so I said that and it, 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 it gave a little lighthearted moment to it, you know. And every year after that, I would always say, how many of you think hugging is better than slugging? <laughs> Well, somebody raises their hand. Let's so start. this is this is how we how we started uh, getting people who had never had know nothing about each other to realize, hey, these are human beings too, and uh, let's see if we can try to get along with each other. Your merit is great, sir. So that was in 1997. Every year we had a survivor come and speak. Uh, once or twice we had someone who was not a survivor but had a major uh, work during the Holocaust or had something to do. We had a lady one time come who was uh, on the Nuremberg trials. Wow, for real. And was involved with uh, interviewing the... Uh, the doctors of death. Yes, wow. a, a young, a young, young woman, American, a young American. I don't remember the details, but like she was like a twenty-one-year-old single American female news reporter. You know, pretty naive and limited in her life, and, and she's Nuremberg. going. To, she's going to Nuremberg, right? Wow. <laughs> Peggy and I went to Nuremberg when we were on our educators tour amazing and we went into that courtroom where the trials were uh so we had a few people like that that weren't survivors but uh they they had an important story to tell amazing oh so there's this movie escape from sobibor you've probably seen that movie philip balowicz he was uh one who was involved in that movie. We had him as a speaker, people like wow. this. He, he was in New York. He's probably not with us now, but his son came down with him from wow. New York and uh, he was one of our speakers, people like that. So it's it truly was, amazing. It was truly amazing. And um, I remember uh, our first speaker, Leah Weems of Blessed Memory, Leah, Sister Ruth is still with us. They were hidden children during the Holocaust. Wow. And Leah was our first speaker in 1997. She lived in, in Houston? In Houston, all in Houston. And of course, she was, you know, a little bit nervous about it, sure. all of that. Uh, but when it was over and she's leaving, two, two things happened. When she told me and Peggy, I've never felt such love in my life. Wow. From the Christians. Mm -hmm. And then the Christians started telling us, well, we've seen movies about the Holocaust. We've read books, but you gave us a human face. Right. You gave us a human face. These are real people. This is not something you read about in a book. Right. Or in a movie, real human beings. And uh, from that, we there's a uh, Holocaust Museum in Houston. And we became regular fi fi fixtures there. Mm. We took over a thousand students wow. to the museum. I, I, I gave lectures 
Now think about this. A, a dedicated, hardcore, conservative Christian minister yes. giving lectures at the Holocaust Museum. <laughs> you know? to, me, to me, that doesn't sound all that crazy, but it that was started then. at some point. It was then. In fact, uh, can I tell you one more story? One more. One more. Well, we'll save this for another time. It's probably time to close out today. But uh, remind me next time, I want to tell you about our very first meeting we had with the Institute for Bread Christian Studies in 1997. You'd like to hear about that story. The Institute, of, what was the name? IHCS, the Institute for Bread Christian Studies. That's one of our ministries. The Institute for Christian he Studies? Hebraic, Hebraic Christian Studies. Hebraic Christian Studies. IHCS. So you, you want to tell me about how you started the IHCS? Now I want to tell you our first meeting. Our first meeting at the IHCS. Okay, we'll keep that yeah. in mind. I'll write it down even. See, my 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 lovely students that you know, they all came through that. Oh, IHCS. Okay, sir. Have yourself a good week and good luck with your uh, much success with your uh, second eye cataract sur surgery. Thank we'll see you. you next week Thank with, you. Uh, with much better view vision and over Bezrat Hashem with God's help over the next few months as well. And my, my, uh, please send my best regards to uh, Peggy. Thank you. God bless you from Texas.